Hello and welcome to the podcast with myself, Matt Davey and Connor Godfrey. In this episode, we discuss the social network with film journalist Tom Beasley. We cover all sorts about the film, from where it sits in the best films of the last decade to revisiting the stacked 2011 Academy Awards. Enjoy. Okay, so The Social Network, a film about Mark Zuckerberg and the creation of Facebook, released in 2010, uh, directed by David Fincher and written by Aaron Sorkin. The film stars Jesse Eisenberg, Andrew Garfield and Justin Timberlake. So Tom is our esteemed guest today. Um, What are your initial thoughts on the film? And do you remember how it was received critically, perhaps when it came out? I mean, first of all, thank you for saying esteemed. (laughs) <laughs> Flattery gets you everywhere. Um, I yeah, I remember when I first saw the Social Network because I would I would have gone to the cinema to see it, and I remember thinking that was really solid, but you know a little bit long, a little bit bloated. And then I found myself going back to the film over and over and over again, and it, I now consider it probably one of the five greatest films ever made. I think it's honestly fantastic. Um, and obviously at the time, um, and I know we're going to talk about this a bit later, but it came out in the midst of this really crowded awards year where we had, you know, some of the best films of the 21st century came out in, in this year. But I remember this one kind of really sort of rising from the pile and, and looking like a, a real kind of critical darling. And certainly when you, you know, because I've got a copy of the Blu-ray and when you look at the quotes on the cover, it's all, you know, a generational game changer of a film and all of that sort of hyperbole that critics like me love to use all the time um and so yeah I think it was and if anything you know it's one of those films that came around at such an opportune time for itself in terms of Facebook and social media and what it was depicting because in 2010 you know obviously social media was massive then but in the decade since it's it's gone incredible and the size of it is is so incredible and so year on year on year it just becomes more relevant as Mark Zuckerberg becomes a more and more powerful person in in our society the notion of him just being like uh you know a nerd in a hoodie in a Harvard dorm is is so far from what he's now where he's essentially exercising a form of world domination on the rest of us so I think it's so fascinating that it came out was such a brilliant film when it came out but it has only grown in esteem in the decade since you mentioned for you it's one of the the five best films ever made. For you, is it the film of that decade? Oh, I'm, oh by a long way, by a long way. Um, I mean, there are films I love in in that you know the last ten years. Um, you know, I, I, obviously the Social Network, and I loved Get Out, and I think Paddington Two is probably in my ten favorite films ever made. I, I adore Paddington Two, but in terms of a film that came along and just hit a generational sweet spot and was so well executed. I mean, it's a big, glossy prestige drama. You know, it's a it's a quote unquote great man biopic of the type we see all the time. And yet I don't think it ever feels hefty or, or worthy. It, it's a film I will quite often just put on while I'm doing other things. Um, and I'm just as happy doing that as, you know, turning all the lights off and sitting and watching it properly um, because it's so entertaining I think beyond everything else you know it is artful and it is you know uh, done with delightful cinematic flair by by Fincher and the script is an absolute all-timer from from Sorkin but even with all of that it's so breezy and so enjoyable to watch it even though you know it seems strange to say that considering my first thought when I first saw it was that's a bit long but now like it just has this breeze to it and this pace and the zip and that's because you know it's a film about people sat in dark rooms hammering away at computer keyboards, but in the hands of, of Fincher, it just becomes something so dynamic. And I think that's what has, uh, has, has led it to, to, to really fly and yet yeah, to certainly be both the greatest film of the decade and the defining film of the decade. It's quite a talky film, but it's mm. that in a good way, because a lot of it is, is just so quotable. What, um, I, I guess maybe we'll have, well, who knows, might have to, the same answer here, but what for you is the most uh, memorable scene of, of the film? Well, I think if, if someone says to you, you know, what's the scene that explains why you like the social network so much? It's that opening scene, I, I, because it's just, it's a perfect example of what you were saying. It's so talky. 
Um, and, you know, I remember uh, reading anecdotes um, that when Sorkin handed in his original script for the film, it was so long. Um, it was, you know, several hundred pages. And they went, well, no one is going to give you the money to make a film this long about this topic. And so basically what they did was they just shot the dialogue twice as fast. And so, you know, that kept the film because it's only just over two hours, I think. Um, and I think the original script was something like three hours, roughly, if you estimated it. Um, but they just talk at such speed. And that opening, it's an incredible bit of writing to begin with, the, the verbal sparring they're doing. Um, it's incredibly performed by, uh, by Rooney Mara and, and, and Jesse Eisenberg. And it's directed with, I think that the joy of what Fincher does with it is it is kind of showy at times, but he knows when to get out of his own way making this. And certainly on some Fincher films, I think, um, you know, as much as I like Panic Room, Panic Room is very guilty of it. Um, I think in a lot of ways Mank was as well, um, that sometimes it's self-consciously directed a Fincher movie. And um, I don't think The Social Network is. And that opening scene is such a great example because it, while it is dynamic and while it is energetic, it is mostly just those two people talking. Um, and, and I just love the, the, the discombobulation and the confusion of it because when Rooney Mara says um, that line about sometimes you say two things at once and I'm not sure which one I'm supposed to be aiming at, we feel that watching it because listening to Mark Zuckerberg talk in that scene is exhausting. We very much feel her pain. Um, and, and so I find that fascinating. And so I do think, you know, if you're going to pick a, a scene that defines the movie, it, it's that one. And it is in, you know, it's in the heritage of, of fast talking, smart cinema. You know, a year or two ago, I watched um, His Girl Friday for the first time. And that film is just incredible. The machine gun energy of its dialogue. And I feel that's the heritage that, that, that leads you into what Sorkin and Fincher were doing with, with Social Network. How about you, Goffrey? Most, most memorable scene for you? It's, it's a good shout. Um, the one you said, Tom, purely because you're right. I mean, the film is dialogue, isn't it? That's the, the basis of the film. So to have, have it start off in that way, it really sets the tone. And you, I feel like you learn so much about Mark Zuckerberg's character just, just, from the way, just from the way he talks, really. I think for me, my favourite scene and the scene that gets me every time is when they're in the in the like the Facebook office and Eduardo Saverin's just been sort of kicked out and then he walks past Justin Timberlake's character and says, the reason I like standing so close to you is because you make me look so tough or something along those lines. I love that scene every time. Oh, I love that scene. Davey? Uh, yeah, to be fair, I mean, if I had to pick three, those two would certainly be in it. And the third would be uh, Eisenberg saying, you have part of my attention, you have the minimal amount. Um, I might be wrong, but I think that's in the trailer. But it's, it's one of those things that I think whenever the social network sort of pops up on, on TV, that's always the one scene that kind of you see constantly, I think. So we'll move on to the cast now. Um, I find the cast quite interesting. Uh, the the mix of people in it is quite, I don't know if strange is the right word, but for you, was it cast perfectly? I think it absolutely is. Um, I think the moment you see Jesse Eisenberg as Martin Zuckerberg, it, it just fits. And so... Um, I, I think you sort of, you find yourself watching it and uh, I, I think uh, Eisenberg has struggled since to kind of get away from Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and, you know, some of the roles he's taken, you know, the sort of jittery, stonery type roles in stuff like Zombieland and um, what was the terror war with Christian Stewart, American Ultra, like films like that. He's really kind of struggling to get out of the sort of the caricatures that, that he's been cast in since Social Network because the role fits him so perfectly and he's so great in it and I think I mean I might be wrong on this I haven't checked it but I think I remember Andrew Garfield saying he originally auditioned for Zuckerberg and then they cast him as Saverin instead and then again once you see him doing it you can't imagine him doing anything else or anyone else doing that role um I mean the really smart one is is Justin Timberlake because it means that he he's always been very clever since he moved into acting and the way he weaponizes his own star presence um I mean, I think of pop star Never Stop, Never Stopping, when the whole thing is, it's almost, he's the opposite of Justin Timberlake. He's this kind of mild-mannered sort of chef guy. Um, but in Social Network, what happens is that the moment you see Sean Parker, because it's Justin Timberlake, you go, that's a celebrity. And that's exactly how Mark sees Sean. Um, and so I think that's a really smart bit of metacasting that um, that really, really works in in, in the film. So I think it's, I think it's a beautifully cast film 
And again, I'm going to keep bringing up awards because I'm still sore about the whole awards thing around this movie. But the fact that Jesse Eisenberg did not win an Oscar for this is beyond me. I just want to go through sort of the individual um, people. I know we've already touched on Eisenberg and Garfield. Obviously, this was Garfield's, for me, his big break. And he's had an, uh, an interesting career since, obviously, gone on to play Spider-Man. He was in Silence. Just one thing about him, though. Him not being Brazilian or having any sort of link to that. Do you think that was a problem at all? I think it's a problem looking back on it. Like, I think if you were casting it now, you perhaps wouldn't cast Andrew Garfield in that role. Um, but the thing is, the problem is, once you've seen him do it, it's hard to imagine anyone else doing it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things where it, it's crazy how far we've come in terms of casting in the last decade, that now the concept of casting him as, in that character, as he said, doesn't have the same heritage, is something we probably wouldn't do. Um, I think that they quote unquote get away with it or did at the time because he's not that well known a person like Eduardo Saverin is not massively famous like he's not as famous as Mark for example um but yes certainly if you're casting it now I think you'd uh, you'd look at someone with, with with similar heritage you touched on um Justin Timberlake as well obviously you mentioned Timberlake chooses his roles very carefully and they always seem to suit him as an actor um do you think it was easy? Because whenever I watch Justin Timberlake, as soon as he comes on, on the screen, he sort of draws everyone in and he comes across quite slimy. And I don't know if that's the right way to word it. But for you, is, is he a good actor or do you think he's just very clever in how he picks his roles? Yeah, I think it comes down to intelligence, actually. Um, because, as I said, the best roles he's done are the ones where he uses his own star power. Like you look when he's tried to do sort of more generic sort of action-y vehicles like uh, In Time and Runner Runner and they're not particularly good films and he's not particularly great in them he's totally acceptable in them but I think yeah I think he has this thing where the best things he does are the ones where he plays with his own persona because I think you have to acknowledge when you're as famous as Justin Timberlake that you do bring baggage to something um you know it's certainly something that Dwayne Johnson does as well he knows that, you know, coming from wrestling and being The Rock and being this larger than life persona, it's hard for him to just go and play a bloke in, in a movie. And so most of the characters he has played in movies are, to some extent, big Dwayne Johnson characters. And so I think that's it. I think it comes down to intelligence, because when you don't have this like chameleonic character actor thing going on, I feel like you have to acknowledge the I guess the limitations but also the opportunities presented by your, your own image and certainly in social network and in pop star he's really self-consciously and cleverly playing with his image. I'm just going to, want to touch on Army Hammer quickly actually just because he doesn't get a lot of credit for this film in terms of you know the main stars Andrew Garfield, Jesse Eisenberg. I think he's very good in this film and, and he plays both of the twins very well. What, what do you think on his performance? Yeah, it's he definitely it's, it's a great performance. Um, Army Hammer's are obviously there's a lot going on with Army Hammer that uh, yeah. <laughs> that means he comes with extra baggage now. But you know, purely on his performance in this film, I think it's a really good performance. Um, I think he has that element, and, and there's a little bit of in, Tim, in Timberlake as well, where he's someone who's too attractive to be entirely trustworthy. And so I, I think of it about characters Henry Cavill plays as well. So when, for example, Henry Cavill was in the Mission Impossible film he was in, you kind of knew that character wasn't going to be entirely wholesome because there's something about Henry Cavill that you go, you're too attractive to be trustworthy. Like, no, no one that attractive can also be a good person. Like, <laughs> I, so I feel there's something of that going on with Army Hammer. But he, yeah, the both of those characters have such a an entitlement to them, such a swagger, such a kind of, disgusting posh entitlement um that you know really permeates i mean it says something about um, about those characters that you almost root for mark zuckerberg in this film mark zuckerberg one of the most troubling and potentially dangerous figures of the 21st century you find yourself almost rooting for him at times and, and part of that is because sorkin gives him all the best dialogue gives him all the like punch the air lines like you know you, you said that the, the line about um having the minimum attention he, he can give and stuff like that. Um, 
And so he gets the funny, the funny lines. Like the, there's the one as well where they uh, quote some figures and he go, stops them so he can check the maths on his notepad. And because, you know, because of the way it's written and because of how funny that bit is, you are kind of on the side of Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and the way the Winklevoss twins are, are portrayed also puts you kind of more on Mark's side than you would otherwise be, given that he's uh, a terrible misogynist who now is trying to take over the world. So I scrolled through uh, IMDb earlier, uh, through trivia to see if there were any casting what ifs. And I only came across two, but the two that I found was that Shia LaBeouf turned down the role of Mark Zuckerberg, and Alfred Molina, who of course uh, famous for, for many things, but I'm sure Dr. Octopus is the one that he's probably most famous for, uh, was considered for the role of Lawrence H. Summers, who is in a brief scene, uh, and that's, that's the president of Harvard. Um, looking at that, I guess we're not too gutted that they, they probably didn't feature, really. No, I think it's fascinating to think of, you know, because uh, if we talked about baggage with Army Hammer, Shia LaBeouf is a guy who comes with, with baggage. Um, but he, he has this sort of intensity as a performer that makes him work for certain roles, uh, notwithstanding the, the horrors of his personal life. But um, he, ha he brings this intensity, and I don't feel like that's the right intensity for Mark Zuckerberg, because he is an intense character, but it's a different kind of intensity. Um, and that's something Eisenberg uh, does absolutely perfectly. And, you know, the Summers role is so minor that it would have been nice for Alfred, Alfred Molina to be in it. It's always nice to see Alfred Molina in something. Um, but yeah, I don't think it, it, it adds or detracts anything from, from the movie as a whole. We kind of touched on it briefly earlier, but looking at Eisenberg in the career he's had post the social network, um, he's done, I mean, a couple of Woody Allen movies, Now You See Me, one and two, Batman versus Superman, uh, Zombieland, Double Tap, kind of post the social network is, you know, not to say he's had a bad career, because he hasn't, he's had an amazing career, but it's, you know, did we perhaps, would we have expected more from him, maybe? Because obviously he's got the one Oscar nomination that was for the social network, none since. Is that maybe a bit of a surprise? Yeah, I think he sort of struggled for more interesting roles, maybe. And I don't know if that's because he's not being offered them or um, or he's just made some unfortunate choices. Or, But I mean, I, I like the Now You See Me films, I think more than most. I think they're, um, they're actually a lot of fun, as stupid as they are. Um, and I like some of his work. Um, there was a film uh, last year, I think, called Vivarium, which was a, a horror movie in which he was in it with um, Imogen Poots. Uh, and that was a really uh, good movie, really interesting, really smart, high concept horror. And he was very good in it. And it had some, you know, he has some of the same nerdy unsettlingness in that which he has in, in Social Network. So um, yeah, he's had an interesting and kind of baffling career. Uh, and you sort of, yeah, you kind of want him to have done more. I think he sort of kind of made some unfortunate choices in terms of franchises he's attached himself to. Because that's kind of where Hollywood sits a lot at the moment is you make a call on a franchise and it goes really well and then your career goes through the stratosphere. Um, ask anyone who signed on Marvel at the ground level in 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, and if you've, if you, yeah, hitched your wagon to that, then, you know, certainly someone like Chris Evans is doing so much interesting work at the moment because he can get anything made because, you know, he was in the biggest movie of all time. Um, so that's a really interesting factor. And then you look at, you know, Eisenberg and the, the franchises he's hitched himself to. Uh, now You See Me, which is, you know, middling and kind of underappreciated. But and then obviously the DC thing and, and, you know, his Lex Luthor being controversial, even when he was cast, even before everything that's happened with the DCEU happened. Um, so, yeah, it, it, in a lot of ways, I think it's more bad luck than any shortcomings on his part. So obviously directed by David Fincher, a personal favourite director of mine. He's directed some great films, uh, Seven, Fight Club, uh, Curious Case Benjamin Button or Zodiac that I watched for the first time recently, which I really enjoyed. Is this for you? Is this the definitive Fincher film? Is this his best work? It's an interesting question, actually, because it's certainly his best work. But whether it's a sort of definitive Fincher film, I don't know. Because it's interesting, like, because if you said, if you asked me what's one of your favourite films, Social Network would come to mind really, really early on. But 
if you like, what's a film that defines David Fincher? I don't know if I'd go to the social network. I think I'd be more inclined to reach for uh, Seven or Zodiac or or Fight Club, as you said. You know, those those three I think feel more, um, I guess, exemplary of what what Fincher is. Um, particularly Zodiac, I think. Um, and so that's quite interesting. The 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 fact that you know, and as I said earlier, I do think a lot of what's so brilliant about Social Network is Fincher's doing. But um, and I think that's one of the fascinating things about him. He sort of resists being put into a box as a director. Um, you know, certainly some of the films he's made, those ones I just mentioned, you know, the, the, the Fight Clubs, the Zodiacs, the Sevens, kind of fit into a sort of similar category. But then he'll make something like The Social Network or like Mank, which is very idiosyncratic and, and, and different to what he's done before. Uh, but yeah, I think that's what makes him fascinating, really. The fact that... Um, he, he's defined by some things and then he has other things which are completely different uh, and, and kind of take you down uh, different directions of what you'd expect from him. Like, and then you have stuff like The Game, which is just a weird film that I don't think completely works, but it's it's such a, a strange and different piece of work. And that's, he's he doesn't like to be predictable. And certainly, I remember when um, he was first mooted as directing the sequel to World War Z, and everyone went, David Fincher, but he he stayed attached to that project for something like four or five years. Um, and so while, you know, that may have seemed like an odd, odd choice for him, particularly after the experiences he had making an alien movie, um, the, the notion of him doing another sequel was, was a fascinating one. So, yeah, I think he's just, he's interesting in that he's kind of done just enough to avoid being boxed into something like you look at Christopher Nolan and if you ask me to pick a definitive Christopher Nolan film it's easy because almost every film he makes is a definitive Christopher Nolan film really um but he sort of accepted that I guess almost that he makes slightly James Bondy big thriller blockbusters with a sort of twist and intelligence to them uh but yeah Fincher is is a bit slipperier and I think that's what that's what makes him fascinating you think maybe because the script of this film is just so good, it almost feels more of a Sorkin film than a Fincher? Yeah, I think there's an argument for that. I think there's certainly an argument for that. And obviously, the fact that you then had Steve Jobs a few years later, um, which was obviously Danny Boyle, uh, those these two films were very close, um, albeit structurally a bit different. Uh, but yeah, I think... I think it's a little bit unfair to Fincher to say that, but I can see why the argument would be made. I can see why someone would say that because, you know, certainly the script is the hero uh, of it. And, and certainly with a, a lesser script, you can't imagine it flying as high as it does because so many of the best moments um, come down to dialogue. They come down to, I mean, I think when we all listed our favourite moments, they were all driven by the dialogue. Um, and, and so I think that's really significant. Um, and so, yeah, I do think it's uh, Sorkin's best thing. I mean, I've never seen The West Wing. It's a, a source of great consternation to a friend of mine who loves it. Um, but I've never seen The West Wing. Um, but I do think that this is as good as, as Sorkin has got. You know, certainly I watched, um, I mean, I like Steve Jobs, but I wasn't blown away by it. And then certainly Trial of the Chicago 7 last year, I thought was kind of just okay. And then, you know, I watched Steve McQueen's Mangrove from Small Axe like two weeks later and went, well, that that's the film trying to the Chicago 7 is trying really difficult to be. And so I think, yeah, I think The Social Network is, is Sorkin's best work. And I think if you were to say that it's more of a Sorkin movie than a Fincher movie, I'd struggle to argue with you. Um, but I think it's, it's kind of a result of this really unique alchemy between them that you you put Fincher the director in with Sorkin the screenwriter and, and this is what pops out. Okay, it's kind of cap off our podcast on the social network. Um, and again, we, we kind of touched on it earlier, but we're going to dive into the 2011 Academy Awards, um, go through a couple of the categories and maybe see with the benefit of hindsight if we'd have changed anything. So the nominees for Best Picture, it's the King's Speech that won, then we have 127 Hours, Black Swan, The Fighter, Inception, The Kids Are Alright, The Social Network, Toy Story 3, True Grit, and Winter's Bone. The King's Speech, the best film out of all of them, The Benefit of Hindsight, would, would we perhaps award it to uh, Best Picture to some, something else? It's crazy, that awards, yeah. Every time I think about it. Because like, when people talk about, like, 
the biggest injustices in Oscar history. Like the things that come up are always like um, uh, Saving Private Ryan losing to Shakespeare in Love or uh, Goodfellas losing to Dances with Wolves or Crash beating Brokeback Mountain. But for me, The King's Speech is like the seventh or eighth best film in that category. <laughs> like The King's Speech is fine. There's nothing wrong with The King's Speech. But to suggest that it's better than The Social Network or Inception or Black Swan or Toy Story 3 or, or The Fighter is just, it's it's madness. And so The Social Network is, is something that absolutely should have won. I think the problem is that the people who, um, I mean, I'm being careful to say the people who voted for the Oscars back then, because the Oscars have done a lot of great work in the last three or four years of, of diversifying their membership. And certainly there are thousands more voting members now, but certainly historically, the type of films that Oscar votes for are films like The King's Speech. And it's not just Oscar. We saw, you know, the Golden Globes giving everything to the crown just this week. Um, and I'm not a TV person, as I said, with The West Wing. I haven't seen The Crown. Everyone I know who's seen The Crown says it's amazing. So maybe it's great and maybe it deserves all those awards. But it, it is a theme that constantly royalty is, is the thing that wins and... The, the decision not to give things to the social network feels even more short-sighted as, as time goes on. You know, anytime Sorkin is interviewed or Eisenberg is interviewed or Garfield is interviewed, they're always asked, are you going to do the social network too? Because so much has happened with Facebook since then. Um, there's plenty of material for a sequel. Um, I mean, for what it's worth, I don't think they should do a sequel for a variety of reasons. But the notion that something like the King's Speech, which everyone forgot the day after they saw it, um, the notion that that should win the Oscar over the social network is just ridiculous. I think it's one of the greatest injustices in, in Oscar history. You know what, when it came out, I didn't see the social network at the cinema. I, I saw it for the first time maybe two years ago. I did see the King's Speech and I think I saw it twice. So my stock in the King's Speech was high back in 2010. Um, Godfrey, Inception's in there. I know you're a big Christopher Nolan fan. Better than the King's Speech. Do you know what? It, the King's Speech is, a, is an interesting one, isn't it? I, I enjoyed the King's Speech and I maybe when I was slightly younger, though, I maybe didn't appreciate it quite as much as I would now. I think the performances are good. I think um, Colin Firth's good in it. Um, Jeffrey Rush as well. I think he's good in it. But when you consider I think Inception's a great film. Black Swan is a great film. To be fair, it's a strong, there's a strong lineup of films that year. I'll say even, even Toy Story 3. Not that I saw that at the time, but it's a good film. You can't really argue with it. But looking at it back in hindsight, it's difficult to argue against. I mean, we're here talking about The Social Network. We're not here talking about Toy Story 3, which for me says it all. That's, that, is, that is big Toy Story 3 slander. <laughs> I declined to I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, a, I think I'm a few years older than you guys. But at the, when, at the time, Toy Story 3 was so enormous. You know, I saw Toy Story 3, I would have been, I would have been 16, I think. And so it could not have hit me at a better age generationally because so many of the life changes that Andy is going through in Toy Story 3 were also happening to me at the exact same time. Um, and so there was such emotional resonance to it. Um, I don't know if that's the same for, for people who were slightly younger, but certainly for me, Toy Story 3 was massive. I mean, yeah, we you know, were 11, weren't we, Dave? Yeah. We were slightly younger, so oh, perhaps that's why we don't appreciate it in the same this, way. This, this, this does not happen to me very often. In like every group I'm in, I'm the baby. And so the notion that I'm like five years older than you guys is blowing my tiny mind a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw Toy Story 3 is the only Toy Story film I, I've seen at the cinema. Um, I haven't seen the most recent one and the uh, first two I saw when I was very young. But I... I couldn't... Yeah, I, I'm, I couldn't, I'm not old enough to have seen the first two at the cinema. <laughs> yes, exactly. But I couldn't tell you the plot of Toy Story 3. I mean, I've seen it, I saw it at the cinema, but I've completely forgotten what that film was about, to be honest. I have to revisit it, I think. But, um, it's absolutely blown my mind. Absolutely blown my mind. <laughs> Best director. Uh, Tom Hooper won for The King's Speech. Uh, we had Darren Aronofsky, uh, nominated for Black Swan. David O. Russell for The Fighter, David Fincher for The Social Network, uh, and the Coen brothers for True Grit. Again, in hindsight, Tom Hooper winning for The King's Speech. If we were to do the awards again now, is he, is he likely to win? 
Well, I mean, considering that Tom Hooper is now like a meme for creating the, <laughs> one of the worst movies ever made, I think the the notion of him ever winning an Oscar again is 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 a remote one. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy. It's crazy that Tom Hooper was a thing for as long as Tom Hooper was a thing. Because, like, I mean, he was not was nominated again for Les Mis, I think. Um, and then certainly the Danish girl was in among the Oscar nominations, even if he wasn't nominated. Um, but to have fallen as hard as he fell with cats is, is quite something. <laughs> Sorry, you, you mentioned, um, yeah, Tom Hooper winning winning the Oscar. Do you think the fact that we've sort of already touched on it, that the, uh, the screenplay by Sorkin was so strong, do you think that almost counted against Fincher in some ways? Because it is such a dialogue, a dialogue focused film. Do you almost think that that sort of takes away from the directing of it slightly? Well, one of the things that's that started to happen, um, I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a nerd for the Oscars. I follow them quite closely. But one of the things that's increasingly starting to happen is we're getting more sort of sharing around of awards. So quite often, if something crystallises itself as the favourite for a screenplay category, it doesn't always improve its chances in Best Picture or Best Director. Um Certainly, obviously, this was an adapted screenplay, but particularly in original screenplay, what you'll see is a stranger film winning an original screenplay and then obviously never getting close to, to, to winning the Oscar. Something like Her, the Spike Jones film, which won the Oscar for original screenplay, but was never going to get near Best Picture. Um, and certainly adapted screenplay, you see things like, um, I think The Imitation Game, the Benedict Cumberbatch film, won adapted screenplay a few years back. And that obviously was never going to get near Best Picture. So I think what we're seeing more and more, because it, not so long ago, it was a truism that if you got if you won in your screenplay category, that boosted your Best Picture chances. It still does to a degree, but we're seeing that less and less and less. And so perhaps because they'd rewarded the screenplay, they felt all right giving everything else to the King's Speech. Best Actor then. Uh, again, the King's Speech. Colin Firth wins for Best Actor. Um, also in that category, there's Javier Bardem, Jeff Bridges, Jesse Eisenberg, uh, and James Franco. Um, again, I, I guess Eisenberg winning it over Firth, if we were to do it again. And um, even Jeff Bridges in True Grit, who obviously, I mean, John Wayne was in the original, to do that remake and basically be as good. I mean, that's quite something as well. So again, I mean, as good as Colin Firth is in The King's Speech, and he is good. Um, if we were to redo it now, is, again, is he a realistic winner? Yeah, no, you give it to Eisenberg every time, and they should have done that 10 years ago. And yeah, the fact that, as I said, the fact they didn't is still a sore point. Um, it's, it's honestly, it's one of the most incredible things the Oscars have ever done to look at that shortlist that year in every category, all of the ones you're listing. And, you know, as, as much as I thought the King's Speech was good, the notion that it's even close to these other films that it's competing against is madness. Like, you know, you look at James Franco doing the work of his life in 127 hours. Um, and it's just, it, it's nonsense to suggest that Colin Firth should have won that. The Social Network should have won everything. I think we should retrospectively go back and do the 2011 Oscars again. <laughs> and we'll just give all the awards correctly to the Social Network. I think with the Oscars, in quite a few cases, they should do them 10 years after the films have come out. Because I think it's yeah. likely that the decision to be better. I mean, I mean, there's so many we could go into, but, you know, Al Pacino never winning an Oscar for, you know, Michael Corleone and The Godfather. And, yeah, it seems like there's certainly many, many questionable decisions. Um, but when it comes to 2011, um, and particularly The Social Network, perhaps the biggest crime of them all, perhaps, is Andrew Garfield not even getting nominated uh, for Best Supporting Actor. He was nominated for Golden Globe and a BAFTA, wasn't nominated for an Oscar, but then you look at who else was in that category. Christian Bale won for The Fighter, uh, John Hawkes, uh, Jeremy Renner, Mark Ruffalo, and Jeffrey Rush. Garfield not even getting a nomination? I mean, how? It's just, it's honestly, it's it's such a nonsense. Um, it, it really is. Uh, the, Garfield absolutely should have been in there and, and he should have won. And the fact that he didn't is is a crime, as, as all of these categories are a crime. And... Um, I think the problem is, and I don't know, maybe there's an element of it where it's easier for us to say this now because it's just, as I said right at the beginning, it's just becoming more relevant year on year, the social network is, you know, because of what Facebook has become since the film was made. Um, 
you know, certainly when you see at the very end of the social network, when he's uh, his friend requested his ex and you see the Facebook design and Facebook has gone through so many iterations since then. I remember when the design was like that. Um, and it's gone through so many iterations since then that you can see the time passing and Facebook is so different now to what it was then. And with hindsight, we can go, well, Facebook is, you know, possibly the most significant thing that's been invented in the 21st century. Um, but you, it would have been difficult to say that in 2010. It's certainly easier to say that now with the benefit of a decade's hindsight. Um, so maybe there's something of that in this Oscars discussion that had they known we'd still be talking about the social network in, in, in a decade's time. You know, certainly no one's talking about um, the King's Speech now. And as good as many of those other films, I can't remember the last time I had a conversation about Black Swan, as great as that film is. Um, and, you know, it goes for all of the others as well. Like The Fighter is a great acting showcase, but, you know, the, the only ones you talk about really are Toy Story 3 and you certainly talk about Inception because of Christopher Nolan and his, his status within the industry. But, yeah, I think it's easier for us now to look back and say, of course, the social network should have won. But maybe at the time, um, and I've certainly I remember the, the King's Speech being a huge box office thing in the UK because, you know, there, there is always a corner that really, really loves the royal family. And so we'll go and see those films over and over again. Um, certainly every time I went to see The Favourite, there were a couple of very shocked looking uh, older people in there who I think had gone to see a film about the royal family and had been very surprised. Um, <laughs> by all of the very frank lines about cunnilingus in it. Um, <laughs> so I think there's, there may be something of that, that this, the, the King's Speech was such a kind of, it was very well liked at the time. Um, I, I, there were very few people who had a bad word to say about it, because it's hard to have a bad word to say about something so um, inoffensively bland. Um, but And so maybe because of that, it sort of felt like, the path of least resistance. And I think sometimes that's what Oscar tends towards is the path of least resistance. Um, you know, certainly you see it in the awarding of films like Green Book. Uh, Godfrey, Garfield not getting a nomination. I mean, how how high is your stock in Jeffrey Rush? Uh, it, it went down after Pirates of the Caribbean, I'll say that. But on Andrew Garfield though, is his, I find his career very interesting because I think of the, the social network in his career is such a huge point. I think it is for Jesse Eisenberg as well, but maybe for different reasons. I think I didn't really know much about Andrew Garfield before the social network. And I remember watching it and thinking, who is this guy? And then obviously he's gone on to do the Amazing Spider-Man, which maybe he's not quite as successful as it could have been. But when you consider, maybe, okay, fair enough, he didn't win, but to not get a nomination, I think, is insane to be honest I, I honestly don't know how I think most of that cast could have been justified to get a nod for some sort of award in that film so I'm surprised it wasn't nominated slightly off topic I think 2016 was his year Hacksaw Ridge and Silence is a one-two it's quite quite impressive um right so the social network despite missing out on best picture missed out on best actor best director best supporting actor uh, won three Oscars uh, Aaron Sorkin, of course, Best Adapted Screenplay. Uh, also won for Best Achievement in Film Editing, uh, which when I was going through my uh, IMDb trivia, um, it was one of the first films to be edited on Final Cut Pro. don't know if you knew that, Goffrey, but obviously for what we do at uni, we do all our film like, editing on that, and that, that was, yeah, struck me as a bit weird. Um, and Best Achievement in Music. Um, so I did win three Oscars for all the bashing we've done about the King's Speech. We'll just jump in with a, just one question, sorry, just to finish. I appreciate we've been going a while. Um, you mentioned earlier, and I picked up on it, you mentioned about a sequel. I didn't know there was a sequel ever really seriously spoken about. And you said, you know, you don't want one to be bad. Now, I'm completely with you on that. I think it would sort of ruin the legacy. But I was just wondering, why, why are you against a sequel? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I think the thing is, the story that you would have to tell to do a sequel is it's a completely different story to what they're telling here. What they're telling here is, at its core, a story about some like misfit kids who stumbled upon something that became far beyond their reach and became far you know, beyond what they imagined it to be. You know, it started as rank ranking which of two women was the most attractive. Like it started as something that puerile and something that crass, and then it became the global behemoth it is now. Um, but if you were to make a film about, say, I don't know, the next decade of Facebook, 
you'd have to include, you know, um, the increasing political influence of Zuckerberg. You'd have to include Cambridge Analytica. Um, you'd have to start talking about genocide in Myanmar. You'd have to start going into, you know, really, really complex things. And it just becomes a different movie. Like, at its core, it's the story about a lot of, you know, nerdy men who got in over their heads. Everything else has been played out in the headlines. We know the story that happened next because Facebook has been under immense scrutiny, as it should be, for most of the last 15 years. So the notion of going over that in a movie, I don't really see the, the need for it. And it certainly would be very dense and very hefty and very, you know, worthy. And I think it would, it would really have to have a point of view. I don't necessarily think the social network has a huge point of view. Um, I mean, you could talk about the social network as a sort of um, a kind of critique of the sort of toxic masculinity that we now have a phrase for in toxic masculinity that we would not have had a phrase for in 2004 when these things were happening. Um, you know, I, I certainly get a bit irked by people because they pick up on that line that the Rashida Jones character says at the very end. Um, she says, um, you're not an asshole, Mark. You're just trying really hard to be or something. Um, and I don't know. I think people see that line as a sort of forgiveness of Zuckerberg. But it isn't because the last image of the film is so pathetic. You've got this man surrounded by this enormous business empire, more money than anyone could know what to do with. Um, he's looking like he's going to come up, you know, he's just been advised basically to pay the settlement it's a drop in the ocean for you it's a speeding ticket i think is what she says um so he's been advised to just pay the settlement and get on with his life he's got all everything he could ever want and yet he sat there refreshing his ex-girlfriend's facebook page hoping she will accept him as a friend like that is pathetic it's a pathetic image of a pathetic man and that's such a good ending for a movie like this because we've seen him rise and, you know, he hasn't fallen. He still hasn't fallen in real life. Like he's still, you know, at the top theoretically. But as a human, he's not reached anything like what he wants to reach because it feels a bit hollow for him. And I think that's such a complex ending for the movie. And inevitably you have to unpick that if you, you do a new movie. And certainly you'd have to, because uh, one of the things that the social network does that's a change from real life is they don't include his partner because it wouldn't have fit into the story they were telling. And, and, you know, that's something that, because I think the real Mark Zuckerberg has been sort of, you know, not, he hasn't condemned the film or anything, but he has pointed out that the portrayal of him as sort of a lovesick guy is not entirely true because he met his partner, I think, at Harvard and, you know, certainly all of that happened. But obviously you'd have to bring her in if you were going to follow it up. And it, it kind of muddies the waters there. So, you know, certainly Sorkin and uh, Eisenberg have both said they're up for doing it. But I think if you were to sit down and sort of try and crack that nut and write that script, you know, we talked about how the, the script for this one would have been unwieldy. Then this one is going to be something else. You're talking about a dense four hour political epic. And really, Mark Zuckerberg, once he became a success, he ain't that interesting. He's just a bit of a pathetic nerd who's a bit misogynist and doesn't care enough about racism or, you know, genocide on the other side of the world when he's you know he has that power um and how much time do you devote to facebook becoming a news platform and that and misinformation it just it becomes so knotty that it just wouldn't be entertaining as a film and as i said right near the beginning the social network for everything it's got going on it's just really entertaining as a film and you're not going to have that zip if you've got a history textbooks worth of material that you have to cover in order to do the story justice.